Um, so, good morning. This is the hills we walked in lockdown. In the last year and a half, we have adventured with Zelda in Hyrule, made homes in Animal Crossing and Valheim and other games, <clears throat> blew up bases in Fortnite, hunted ghosts in Phasmophobia. Our two of gamers now are going to discuss the digital worlds we've explored while we couldn't leave the house. Uh, with me, I've got Brian Nisbet, Casey Explosion, and Gry Gree. Gry? Sorry, angry, yeah. Angry. <laughs> and Esther Callan Stewart. <clears throat> I am Paul Anthony Short. I am an author of fantasy and urban fantasy novels. Uh, I am also the access advisor for the Glasgow 2024 bid. Plug, plug, plug. Uh, and at the moment, kind of a wannabe game designer. Uh, I have a couple of ideas brewing in my head. <clears throat> And I'm going to go around in the order that I have us on the, that we are in the, on the stream and have everyone introduce themselves. So cl clockwise, starting with Brian. Okay, hi, I'm Brian Nisbet. Um, I am, what am I these days? I don't know. Well, I mean, there's a job I do that makes me money, but mostly seem to be a gamer and con runner. Um, and uh, I have been gaming since the early eighties um, on a variety of platforms, tabletop, computers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I have run a lot of games conventions in my time, written a lot of scenarios, uh, done some occasional professional games writing as well, uh, which actually I'm getting doing some more of at the moment, which is wonderful. And uh, yeah, I'll play anything with anybody within reason. Mm. As an aside, I believe you ran the very first con game I played at. That it, is entirely possible. It was MooCon. Oh God, <laughs> that's that's a long time ago now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the stream image has changed. Oh, there we are. Uh, Anne. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Green. I'm from Russia. I'm currently in Moscow. It's very sunny outside. Um, I do teach law and cinema, and I manage an Irish film festival in Russia. And I also play games. And there is another plug that I would like to start with is that I also co-edit. Uh, some of the issues of Journey Planet, which was Hugo nominated this year. But we have an open call currently going on for Zelda and the Irish influences in Zelda. So if you're interested, please write me. <laughs> okay. <coughs> and Esther. Hello, I'm Esther McAllister. <laughs> and I am the uh, bid chair for Glasgow 2024 Worldcon. Um, and I am also I'm also a professor of video games. Um, that is just so badass. <laughs> with confirmed last week. Uh, I've lost my ass. I was an ass professor. The ass is no more. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm still so pleased that I kind of stop after I've done that bit. But yeah, obviously, obviously I'm a gamer. Um, and I do a lot of writing about games as well. Cool. And Casey. Hello there. I'm Casey, uh, Casey Explosion on Twitch and Twitter. I'm a Twitch streamer. I play, play video games, shockingly. Isn't that, uh, is that a coincidence? And um, yeah, that's it. Not that exciting, but I am a sloth. You online. are the only cartoon character on the stream, on, on the panel, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. So where are we? All right. So let's get right into it. Um, question time. What have you been playing during lockdown? Uh, did you pick any new, any new favorites or turn to the old ones? What is about the game question that made you spend countless hours in the virtual realms? Uh, I think you can tell from my background here, I've put a lot of hours into Valheim. Uh, that's my meat hall right there. Uh, it actually stands around the back there. That, that's the kitchen. You can see right there, and there's our beehives. The bees are happy. <clears throat> uh, I've also done a lot of phasmophobia. That has resulted in many 4 a.m. Uh, crawling to bed encounters uh, and Among Us. Um, and as I mentioned briefly, uh, some Star Trek Online, because last year I decided I'd been playing this game for 10 years, and I got a lifetime sub. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, so let's start with Casey. Yeah. So during 
During lockdown, I too have been playing a lot of Valheim. It's uh, it's a really wonderful game that I find kind of kind of breaks the mold of the whole crafting survival game, wherein you know, a lot of the a lot of the sort of crafting survival would have you kind of slowly starve to death. You you need to constantly keep on top of variously dwindling meters of hunger, thirst, sleep. And that doesn't that doesn't exist in Valheim. You you won't you won't die from not eating. It's like it's it's a much more encouraging game. You get you get a buff from from eating. The the better the food you cook, the bigger the buff you have. And it's 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 a it's a subtle difference, but it's a big one. It it never feels punishing. It never feels like, oh crap, I'm gonna starve to death now. It's like, no, that's 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 not part of the game. It's 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 this wonderfully encouraging kind of kind of mindset that you have going in there. It's like, oh, you could eat a little more. And it's yeah, it's, a, it's just a wonderful game to play with people. Just hop on a Discord with a, have a little community there and play with friends and build build your Viking mead hall and brew mead. Yep. It's, it's marvelous. I love it. Great. Um Esther. Oh gosh. I I kind of feel like I'm I don't know which one I want to talk about because there are some there are some that were more important to me than others over the last kind of where it's more a year and a half really. Um I I got very into things that I'd already been playing. Um but I also and I'm kind of a bit of a champion of this I play a lot of games on my phone. And the two major ones that I've played on my phone are Disney Emoji Blitz, which is basically the best match three game ever. It's it's obviously it's got Disney's bark behind it. So it's very, 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 very good. It's very streamed, um, streamlined and uh, water sort puzzle, which is one of those terrible uh, things that you get constant adverts for. So I actually downloaded it to make it shut up. Um, and I'm now on level 557. So, <laughs> so that, that, that was a success. Um, but I also did a lot of writing. Um, I think one of the things about being an academic in games is people are like, oh, you must spend all your time. You must spend all your time playing games. And actually, you have to fit them in between all the other things you do. But I, I did a lot of writing and I did a lot of watching. Um, I specialize in how players understand games and how they tell stories. So my year has been bookended with the sound of actual play podcasts and Twitch streams. Um, I've watched most of Critical Role. Um, I've watched most of Dimension 20. Um, and I've listened to all of the Adventure Zone. I'm actually, <laughs> to, and after I had a meeting with my vice chair earlier, but I had to actually stop listening to the recent episode to come onto the panel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of, it, it's been much more about watching other people play as well. But I've also, again, I've, I've played, I played a lot of D&D online as well. So, or, or at least kind of through the phone. Um, my partner is in, Dublin at the moment we needed things to connect together uh, we finished playing Card Hunter so we played all of Card Hunter which is available online it's really good um, we didn't really know what to do next so we decided to start a two-person campaign so I'm I'm playing that so, nice you know. mm. yeah excellent uh Anne um yeah it's a it's not a hard question it's just so many of those games that <laughs> I was playing um Actually, yeah, starting from uh, where I left off before the um, COVID happened was I played Oxygen Not Included uh, a lot. Yeah. And so, yeah, I dove into that full on. And um, that's actually, I've been thinking about this. Maybe that's that's more of a therapeutic uh, gaming uh, discussion, but um, I realized that I never left the planet. Like I get to the surface and that's it. Like I start again. And uh, yeah, because why would you travel to space? It, it's <laughs> it's not what the game is for me, at least about. Um, then I rem remember that uh, there was another strategy that I enjoyed. And since my brother left uh, the country and uh, as a form of reconnection to him mentally, I started watching people playing StarCraft. 
and played myself as well in the um, the older one, the first one. Um, another one was for me Blazing Beaks uh, because we got Switch with my husband and it was released on Switch. Uh, and we spent like countless hours just um, venting down from work and this new thing that we had to just be at home all the time. So, and I also lost a family member and it was just my thing, like to not think about anything, I would just kill evil radishes and <laughs> <laughs> pixelized. So it's a very bright game. Um, um, yeah, and um, I guess Animal Crossing. I even bought a themed Switch so I could play just Animal Crossing on it, you know, and it's already like, 300 hours played on in Animal Crossing alone. So, um, and my husband also got into game design and he's now making games <laughs> mostly for me. <laughs> but <laughs> it's also an interesting thing to be thinking about games and why we play them and just uh, thinking about this whole gaming experience from the inside out. Cool. And Casey. <clears throat> yes. Brian? No, no, Brian. We joined Casey. <laughs> Sorry. I'm getting it's, mixed it's, up. It's all good. I mean, we look very similar. It's the fuzzy, <laughs> fuzzy face. Um, uh, no, so, I mean, you know, uh, some of the games didn't change. Um, World of Warcraft is always there, ever present, albeit lockdown happened kind of between expansions. So um, there wasn't there wasn't as much to play there, but you know a lot, lot of World of Warcraft. But what was really interesting was we then started playing Among Us as a guild. So nice. pre-prepared group of people uh, to go and play to go and play Among Us as it hit its crazy uh, craze phase. Say that three times backwards fast. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of Among Us amongst a group of people that we knew really well. Um, and I think a lot of that. Uh, one of my fellow con runners um, introduced me to our Lord and Savior Hades. So that took a lot of my time. <laughs> a lot of my time. Um, I sort of eased off on playing that, it must be said. But yeah, there was a period of time and I killed at least one keyboard <laughs> um, playing right. that game. Uh, and my poor wife was like, oh, you're, you're playing Hades then. That's why the desks are shaking. Okay. Um, so so that, that space bar was just hammered into, you know, into submission. Um, other kind of smaller games, SteamWorld, which I played a little bit of previously, but I then ended up um, playing through all of the SteamWorld games that were there, including the... Um, actually, Casey, I think it might have been on your, on your recommendation. Um, yeah, I love the SteamWorld games. Uh, I highly recommend, you know, the, the the digger ones, and then the phase combat SteamWorld Heist is just is just wonderful. Um, and then replaying a bunch of things. I think I replayed a load of um, Saints Row, and as we come out of lockdown, ah. um, uh, Mass Effect Remastered uh, did buy bought that because I didn't, you know, I. Only had one copy of it already, so needed more. Uh, so played through, played through all of that as well. Um, uh, but also, just one of the, the one of the big things that again, board game arena. That was one of my big, you know, discoveries as they are oh, the poor suffering people, as they went from having a fairly tiny player base, relatively speaking, to suddenly everyone in the world trying to log on to board game arena, and yeah, it them having from, it went from about um, ten thousand. Um, or 10, 10 to 50,000 to uh, 570,000 in a month. <laughs> so this sort wow. of crazy research I had to go and look up. Which, <sighs> and, and if you look at the graphs, like there isn't actually, you, you can't make a graph because <laughs> it's too crazy. <laughs> um, and we gave them money because, oh my God, they were so deserving of money. Um, and it's two pounds a month, two euro a month even. So, you know. Yep, that's good. <clears throat> Okay. Hmm. So, uh, next question. Do you think there's any new trends in gaming at the moment? Um, like, for example, most of us 
when we mentioned the games we were playing there, we're talking about games we could play with others. Um, there wasn't that much mention of any single player games, even though we've had a lot of big single player releases this uh, this past year. Um, I don't so think I said a single game that I played with another person apart from physically, which was D and D. All the games. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> yep. Sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> so I lost my notes now. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> um, so do you think we're drawn more towards more aggressive and violent games now at the moment or less ones? Um, are we pulling more towards social games, during, especially during the pandemic, as a way of connecting? Um, and what do you think about the big hits of the last year and a half, such as, you know, like we've mentioned Among Us, Phasmophobia, Valheim, um, you know, I, it could be my could be blinkers on me, but I haven't seen the same attention um, page towards a single player experience quite as much in the last while. Um, Casey? I think there's a lot of variety out there, more so than ever. I think that's the main thing that I would I would say. Um, there is so many, there's been a sort of during lockdown, it seems like there's been an explosion of lots of really, really good indie games and kind of that that slightly mid-tier, kind of not not quite indie, not quite kind of big publisher um kind of kind of that kind of that kind of mid-tier kind of game and there's been so many great ones that have been coming out recently it's it's been nearly impossible to keep up um I had a wonderful time this year there's a marvelous little game that i played called death store which absolutely beautiful made by a two two person developer studio and you play a little crow Who's um who who takes up a job as as a reaper of souls, and it's this kind of kind of isometric, almost Zelda ish kind of. It's kind of got a Dark Soulsy kind of kind of vibe to it. Beautiful style, wonderful soundtrack, and it's just it's just all these kind of these kind of small games that wouldn't have as big a profile as say something like like um something like Among Us or Valheim or something that makes it big on, on a lot of streaming platforms and and uh, YouTube shows and things like that. It's like, it's, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful amount of games that have been coming out. And it's just, it's just it hasn't stopped. I think that's the one thing that's, uh, one thing that's been pretty good this year, just constantly, constantly more games coming out. It's, it's marvelous. Yeah, definitely more than I can keep up with. <laughs> um, Anne? Yeah, I think it's, um, for me, for, for my personal experience, I'm more drawn nowadays to games that have zero interaction with other people. I tried getting onto Among Us and I just didn't get it. Like, I couldn't play it. And this is why I kind of go and play my own stuff in my own time, you know. Um, and Animal Crossing, like I don't even use those. Um, you, you can um, invite people onto your island or go to others' islands when you fall asleep, kind of situation. It's it's hard to explain it if you never played it, but um, I, I don't do that really. <laughs> you know, it's just my own island. My husband comes sometimes, but that that's pretty much it. So for me, um, it, this whole experience was just looking out for games where I can play on my own. So it, it might be a depiction of what's happening outside and what was uh, happening outside. Um, so it wasn't a way to interact with others at all. Okay. Um, Brian. So I think, I mean, it's a similar thing. When, we, when I talk about Among Us and, and WoW, which are the two you know, big multiplayer games that I'd, I'd play, that's with a group of people. And it's with a group of people that I've known for over a decade at this point in time. Um, so there's no earthly way I would have started joining random Among Us um, servers or whatever 
not interested. But playing with a group of people who I enjoy playing games with, um, absolutely. But everything else is is individual. Um, I think, you know, I looked at a couple of games, like, uh, and I just, yeah, there was, I had no big draw to suddenly start playing more multiplayer games, especially not with people that I didn't, that I didn't know. Mm. Um <clears throat> And that's always been the big problem with, with things like MMOs. If you haven't got the community there, then it suddenly becomes, you know, you're bumping into random, random people. Um, so I think the majority of the games that I played, but then again, the majority of the games I've played throughout the entire history of me playing games have in reality been single player games, um, you know, or they've been very, very small groups. I mean, that's, I think the, the vast majority of them are still that. But I, my wife is playing a lot of Deathloop at the moment. And it has the facility to allow, um, unfortunately, first person perspective games aren't for me, which is why I bounced off Cyberpunk 2077 as well. But that has the ability to allow other people come in and play one of the, the characters. And she turned that off uh, essentially after the first time it happened, because it was like, no, 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 this is my this is my game. I don't want random people coming in and, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and messing around with it. Yeah, that's interesting. Right? Yeah, the death kind of reminds me of uh, Watch Dogs One, uh, where you could have other players could invade your game as fixers, trying to steal data from you or something. But there was no actual penalty to you, other than having to wait maybe five minutes while they did their thing. If you wanted, so you could just ignore them. They got their bonuses, but nothing happens to your game, which I thought was a very clever way of allowing that sort of option where you're not penalized for what someone else can do in your game. <clears throat> and Esther. Sorry, I'm a bit slow on the unmute today. Yeah, I mean, I think, as I said, most of the ones that I, I played were things that were on my own, but all the writing that I did was about games that either other people were playing or that I was kind of watching. I actually, so I wrote about lockdown gaming quite early on and I kind of looked at three different things. I looked at Animal Crossing, um, which at that point was just starting to tail off a little bit, but um, there was some kind of really fascinating things about Animal Crossing that were very much about like trying to make the, make the outside world come in. Um, so obviously you're kind of creating your own environment. Even if you don't want to interact with people, you can still get really close to them. So you can stand right next to them. And this was when, you know, we were really being told to distance. Um, you can you can buy all these things that you can touch. You can give people presents that you can touch. You can buy things from the shop that you can touch. Like there was a lot of that going on. Um, but the really fascinating thing that I found about Animal Crossing was that um, it sold. Uh, oh God, I'm going to have to try and remember. It, it sold, I think, 17 million units. Um, however, that doesn't count Japan because Japan count in a different way because they don't count any online downloads that online downloads don't count which is crazy but what i actually discovered was that ultimately it sold 24 million units and the majority of those were physical and animal crossing sold out at one point and i think angry was really interesting when you were like oh i bought the, the actual switch for it animal crossing actually sold out at one point of physical copies and people instead of downloading it which you could do within like an hour People waited for their physical copy to arrive and it took two months. And it was just, wow. this it was so interesting. And there were all these other things that were sort of happening that were all about like people just wanting to just touch things and hold things. Um, and so that was kind of one thing that, that I sort of, that, that seemed to be a sort of big trend. Um, but the other one actually also relates to something that Angry just said, which was um, about the idea of playing a game but not wanting to get off the earth. And it's like, why would you go into space right now? You know, it's even more lonely or whatever your reason is. Um, so I played a lot of The Witcher and I got I got really into the Witcher universe. I, I appreciate that there are problematic elements about The Witcher and it's OK to like problematic things. Uh, but I listened to the first audio book. I didn't want to listen to the second one because it's got stuff from that's going to be in the second series. I watched the series three times, which is a big deal for me. And I played the game. I played the game a lot. And I loved the game. I loved the world. I loved the people. But the thing that I noticed that I was doing was I wasn't using the waypoints to fast travel. I was getting on Roach, the horse. 
I'd perfected a way that in my head, I was running up to Roach and then I'd press A and I'd vault into the, her saddle and then i just ride. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until I sat down and sort of thought about what I was doing, I was realising that I was riding through countryside and I was looking at the rivers and the streams and going across places and being like, oh, yeah, there's usually a mob here and I've got to go fast. Come on, Roach, let's go. Clippity, cloppity, cloppity. But it was the physicality of being outside in a, in a world, in a place where it didn't matter that I could, didn't have to take my half an hour prescribed government walk, you know, <laughs> which is crazy because I live in Stafford and Stafford is a very low population town in the centre of England. And actually, it was very easy to get outside without going anywhere near people. I could, I can get onto, I keep looking out the window because I can go across the train line and I can get onto a piece of wetland within about five minutes and there is nobody there and I can walk there and it will be a good five kilometre walk and I can come home. So it wasn't as if I didn't have access to the outside that wasn't safe, but there was this craving for this bigger world, this bigger environment. And yeah, I was like... I think I'm just going to be forever thankful for The Witcher for for being there in the same way that kind of critical role has been has meant a lot and Animal Crossing meant a lot to people. So, yeah, that was kind of the trend that I noticed both kind of in myself and then the sort of really interesting one that I studied as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I so, so I should say, it sounds a bit like my my, my travel experience in, in the Spider-Man on PS4. It's like, why would you use the fast travel when you can swing through New York and it's this oh, yeah, glorious it's really... feeling of movement and freedom and, yeah. and, and all of those things? I love the um, opening storyline in that game as well, where he's trying to pick up Tofu for Aunt May. <laughs> so the reason that he's learning to web swing through New York is he's got a he's, he's fibbing to her that he's not killing bad guys and that actually what he's <laughs> doing is he's trying to find a supermarket and he can't find any tofu so he's got to keep going to another supermarket and then he's like oh no the deli was yeah the deli was definitely closed <laughs> brilliant it's a really yeah it's a good game <laughs> I'm, I'm very jealous of people who, who can play that because i haven't got playstation so. i watched it again i watched it i watched dj knight play it and actually yes. again um as a sort of recommendation dj knight's also somebody who did the um into the oh god i can never get it right it's the afrofuturist actual play podcast i'll yep. put details in the chat afterwards um into the motherlands <laughs> um and DJ Knight's one of the players on that and they run a stream and it's kind of a very specific kind of low key, very friendly chat while they, while they play games. Um, and that's, that's where I watched Spider-Verse. <laughs> that's where I watched the game. <laughs> so yeah, God, I don't have time for a big game like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so moving on then. Um, so basically video games are now the most profitable entertainment industry in the world. They out, sell every other one combined pretty much do you think the view of video games has changed is it more are they more accepted now in mainstream as it is it the same as always um one of my notes that i was, I was given for this asks are they still banned by schools which is a weird thing when i was growing up you couldn't play video games in school but it's interesting to note that my own kids now they have like the school uses mobile apps for talking to teachers and they're doing lessons on Chromebooks. Uh, so what do you all think about that, that, how society views video games now? And this time I'll start with Anne. Um, it's hard to say. Again, my perspective is from Russia and mm. we, yeah, maybe a lot of people are playing games and you walk into a Metro and people are either uh, playing, um, three in a row kind of games or they're chatting in a messenger so that's that's the whole variation of people uh, activities um, nowadays uh, when they have to uh, some free time so i'm not sure if if um, uh, we still have this problem of acceptance of gaming uh, everybody does that everybody has a, a platform for it uh, which is very accessible it's a smartphone um, I mean, in, in the big cities, at least, and uh, computer games are also accessible and a lot of them are free, uh, initially, at least. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, 
I still feel like I, I work at the university, so I still would would feel this kind of sending kind of thought of oh you're playing a game you'd better study you know um but still yeah i would accept that as a, as a normal behavior now especially in myself <laughs> um casey yeah i think you know you, nearly everybody i know is is almost some sort of gamer so you know that's it's it, it is it is what I do. Like I, I play games on Twitch for people to watch and you know have a nice have a nice chill time. So it's kind of like if people aren't playing games, they'll watch people playing games. It is it is one of the like it's it's a it's a big form of entertainment. Even even my mom occasionally tunes into my streams to, to watch and Give her opinion on on what I'm playing, saying, "Oh no, no, I didn't like that one. That one was that one was too violent." Or, "Yeah, yeah that one looked like with the little fella going around for the whatever whatever way she'd describe it." So yeah, you know, it's like cool. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit. It, I I can't say I can't say I I see any 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 negative kind of mm. comments about it, but. Uh, Brian. So, I mean, and I mentioned this to you in the, in the email, uh, Paul, it, it's so Terry Pratchett had uh, the whole theory that humans are, are, are pans and arons, the storytelling ape. Yeah. Because we all tell stories, even when we don't think we are around the, the water cooler offices, if you remember what they are, um, and things like that. We all tell stories and, and everybody's a storyteller. I firmly believe that he missed half of that off. Uh, we're, and this is pig Latin of the worst kind, but Pans Narns Ludens. We are the we are the game playing storytelling ape. Um, because everybody has always played games. And they may not realize, and there was there was a stigma there for a long time around around computer games, especially as they started, you know, the 80s and and and, and onwards. And then you had people, this notion of dark basements which we don't have in Ireland, but anyway, uh, people in dark basements playing games and why wouldn't you go outside and, and, and run around in the sun, et cetera, et cetera. But people are still trying to convince themselves that they're not gamers, despite the fact they may have spent a million hours on Candy Crush or despite the fact they might spend every evening playing FIFA or otherwise with their, with their friends. It is endemic. It has always been endemic in humanity that we play games and I think there will always be a, unfortunately, humans will always try and find something that is, is other, you know, and, and if you, if you told someone that, well, um, I, you, the amount of time I've played, you know, spent on, on World of Warcraft, be like, oh, no, that's really weird. And you're like, well, how much time did you spend on, on, on FIFA or, you know, on, on yeah. League of Legends or whatever else? So there'll always be a little bit of othering. There'll always be a little bit of, well, that's not what I do, but yeah, humanity plays games. And, and as Anne said, and you know, you walk into a public transport system, everyone's there with their phone doing something. Um, and most of that's gaming. So um, reality is that everybody's doing it. Unfortunately, reality is also that people will still find different ways of going, well, I don't mean that game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Esther. Yeah, I mean, I think this is it. So there's kind of two things here. There's the, the fact that we know that everybody plays games. But there's also, I think, as both, in fact, as everybody has said, there's this kind of societal myth that, um, that games are something other and bad. And they still are, like, the, a new media hasn't come along. Um, but there was a massive, like, this actually really relates to lockdown because there was a massive international pivot about this. Um, so in uh, 2018, uh, the World Health Organization, and I'm sure some of you might remember this, d finally classified gaming um, under their addictive behaviors dossier. Um, it was code 6C51, gaming disorder. 
Um, I've got the most amazing picture of this because it's just this like soulless um, sort of infographic person staring into space. And so they basically said gaming is an addiction. We're finally, you know, we finally kind of got there. And in 2020, they panicked slightly because obviously um, suddenly everybody's gone indoors. Um, the only way that they can communicate or one of the only ways that they're communicating collectively is games. Turns out there's these massive worlds in games, you know, the worlds of the Witcher, the worlds of World of Warcraft, the worlds of Deathlooper, you know, they're all there. Um, and so they literally spun on their heel and they they completely changed uh, their attitude and they, um, they, they produced this uh, campaign in March 2020 called Play Apart Together. So play a part apart oh, hilarious uh, together and it encouraged so i'm just going to read the blurb a promotional campaign that encourages healthy physical distancing by bringing special events exclusive activities rewards and inspiration to some of the most popular games in the world and 40 gaming companies got behind this and this is like league of legends to zynga so from you know from um candy crush to uh, uh league of legends and and all these kind of big companies and it was just i just thought it was just so interesting because it's it's this kind of like look we've been saying this forever we know this us people you know this massive thing that generates all this revenue one company games workshop in the uk generate more money than our fishing industry all of our fishing industry one company one shop you know? <laughs> and and so this kind of whole like should we still be playing games thing is like yeah yeah <laughs> but also i think if we're looking at a positive from lockdown gaming that's actually a positive that the world health organization who again all these big bodies who'd previously been saying games bad games for children games yeah hide on the like if you if you ask somebody on on angry's train what it is they'll play, they're playing. They'll say, oh, it's just some Candy Crush. And you'll look at it and it'll be like, I don't know, flick football. <laughs> you know? It's like nothing like that game. But I think the legitimizing through lockdown of the fact that there was this sudden, like, actually, we kind of knew that games are good for you and games were kind of there and everybody plays them. And now, we, now we're gonna weaponize them was really interesting. And he's a positive, you know? Because that attitude, they can't roll that back. You, UNESCO, World Health Organization, you, you, can't, you can't undo that. Sure, you can pretend that, you know, gaming, gaming disorder is still a big thing and you're going to make a big fuss about it. But you were there, play a part together. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> a, rant, a ranting is over. Slash <laughs> end, end rant. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Rant away. I'd uh, actually like to add something. because. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I worked at the university and uh, during the COVID times, we had to switch to either hybrid and then fully to uh, online education. And a lot of it was based on uh, gamification of the whole process because you had to use different variations of uh, educational techniques. And the majority of them is nowadays to include some gaming um, mechanisms, uh, mechanics into your education system. And now we're offline, uh, almost fully offline, um, again at the universities, and we still are aiming at this gamification trend to stay because it uh, proved to be um, interesting and engaging for students. And so we're now, I'm actually working now at my university in the uh, department team that is looking into integrating the whole student experience into this narrative throughout the whole four years of bachelor's degree, that they gain points, that they uh, have those levels. So it's like, it, it's a game in real yeah. life as well. Okay, we actually have a question. Uh, so we're getting close to the, the, the end. Um, uh, so Claire Cat 5 asks, feedback from a gamer is that graphics have been enhanced at the expense of story, would you agree? Hmm. Um, Brian, I mean, it depends. Uh, is is the is the the short answer to that? If I look at something like, let, let's take Hades, um, it's gorgeous, and it's certainly a lot more. You know, the graphics are vastly better than Rogue was forty, you know, forty years ago, and it has a stunning story. You know, um, absolutely amazing. 
uh, there are other games which, and I appreciate the patches and I appreciate how much people are enjoying it, but one of the criticisms, you know, leveled against um, Cyberpunk was, was that they tried to make it too good and too flashy and that broke bits of the game. But the story there again is, you know, again, what I've been, what I've been told is, is amazing. So I, I think there are always going to be bits where some developer prioritizes one thing over another, or, or especially in, in AAA stuff where they, they want to look flashy and amazing and they want to make you have to get a graphics card that could, you know, could power a small city. But I think there's so many games out there that are being made, especially the more indie ones, which are story over and above everything else. And the graphics are still lovely to look at. Uh, Esther? Yeah, I think I agree. I think <clears throat> games, games, games are so big now that, yeah, there are ones that privilege graphics over narrative. Um, but also games is, you know, board games and alternate reality games and uh, video games, all, you know, all games. Um, but I think if you want a really good example of a game in which the graphics tell the story and that kind of, you know, sort of puts paid to that point a little bit um, is the Mystery of the Obra Dinn which is an entirely wireframe black and white game in which you have to work out the narrative through looking at different angles of what of what is going on. It's got the most fantastic music as well. It's a Switch game. It's usually, it's usually between kind of seven and 10 pounds. So uh, 10 to 15 euro. Um, and yes, some, some big games do not tell particularly good stories, even if they try to, but at the same time, there are thousands and hundreds of things. And I think, yeah, you know, the indie games, if you look at some of the Hugo nominations this year, you've got Hades, you've got Spiritfarer, you know, there are, there are things that are there that are telling really interesting stories. But also at the same time, do you really want a really engaged story for Among Us? Because it's a really good game, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, yeah, sure, it's Werewolf with sewers, but... <laughs> but it, 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 doesn't need, it doesn't need to have a massive backdrop narrative. And yet there's a huge amount of fan art and fan writing that surrounds it. I mean, yeah, maybe it's because the little creatures, the little people are really easy to replicate, but isn't, isn't that indicative that there is a good story there as well? So mm, I think like there's so many possibilities. So yeah. Um, and? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, my husband started to get into this gaming design and game design and we talked about all the different mechanics that exist and in, in narrative and storytelling. And as Casey said before, there's just so many games now being released, both by indie games and by big studios. And you can choose whichever suits you. So I wouldn't say that um, graphics would uh, trump over uh, storytelling as much for a player because the player plays his own game in his head despite what the pixelated art is not real, right? It's, it's not the real, real experience, although our brain creates it as a real experience. And I think that uh, we're going to see very soon that VR takes over and we're going to be sitting in our VR suits, experiencing some sort of story with the whole body experience. Uh, and it's already kind of there. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Casey? I think, I think it, it, it depends. That's it's going to be my answer for a lot of stuff because gaming gaming is it has become far more broader than you know just just the big titles. You've got so many more indie or smaller smaller studios just filling in so many different gaps and niches. And I think a lot of what's fun about games is a lot of the emergent storytelling, the stories we make ourselves. And um, uh, one, one game that I was playing during, you know, uh, during this, this, this summer was uh, Days Gone, which is uh, a kind of zombie apocalypse biker game. And had a lot of fun, had a lot of fun with that, riding around on the bike. And there was lots of really, just just wild stuff that could happen in in the game world once you got into it and um it, so like managing to tr to trick a zombie bear into fighting a horde of zombies for me 
it's just <laughs> one of these weird things that can that can happen in the game. It's like there's there's yeah. lots of it's 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 lots of fun, and it'll be moments like that that I remember most from the game, rather than the the actual plot, which is it's okay. It's it's, but it's the fun kind of kind of emergent storytelling that happens organically through play that'll stick with me. And it's the same with playing with Valheim, you know, somebody somebody was saying that a great, great, great little story about accidentally bringing it, bringing a troll back to their, back to their settlement and breaking everything. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's something. So, you know, then, then, then there's a lot more narrative focused games. Uh, when, when I played this, um, this year was uh, Adios, which is very, very, um, very low key kind of story, um, short kind of narrative game. It's all about the story, but and um, another another interesting game that does does some. I feel like some of the storytelling is through through the graphics. Is a game called um, Cruelty Squad, which to look at this game, you're like, this looks like an eyesore this is horrible to look at and um it's it's a genius game because you're in the you're in the in put in put in the shoes of a of an a corporate assassin for in a in the, the weird dystopia and you cut you cut it the the horrible kind of eyesore kind of kind of visuals are kind of like oh oh so this is how the character sees the world. It's, it's like, right. um, mm. you know, it's like there's so many different types of games that we can play that are that are that are either just solely narrative focused themselves, use their graphics to tell a story, or, or games where storytelling just kind of like is something that we create our own stories as we play through them. So yeah, cool. Um... Hmm. There are more questions, but we're pretty much at time, uh, so I don't think we'll be able to get to them, uh, which is a shame, sadly. Uh, but um, there will be the Discord uh, channel if anyone wants to hang out there and ask some questions there. I'll probably be there and at the Glasgow 2024 fan table for a bit. Um, so, well, this has been the hills we walked in lockdown. Uh, Hope everyone's had a good time. There is still tons more I could talk about on this subject. Uh, so yeah, do hit me up. Um, I it had is... I'd hoped to, to get some story, some fun stories in from, from just unique experiences like emergent storytelling, like you mentioned, Casey, but I don't think we'll manage that this time. Uh, so I have been Paul Anthony Short, and I'm gonna sign off here. Mm -hmm.